Good morning and welcome to LUMC's weekly worship service. We're so happy to have you join us this morning as we continue our series called Beyond the Words. Today, Pastor Brandon will be taking us through Mark 6 and revealing to us one of the toughest days in Jesus' ministry, a day that leaves him feeling so alone. But before that, we're going to begin our service with some music. Join me and let's sing together. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us. You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross.
Amen. Now, before we get into the rest of our service, I'd like to share with you a few announcements. Right now, take a look at the button on the right that says Connection Card. Go ahead and click that button and fill one out, even if you filled one out before. The Connection Card is a great resource. It's a way to register your attendance and let us know that you're here with us today. It's a great way to take next steps and sign up for activities in the church. And most importantly, it's a way to share your prayer requests with us. Every Monday, Pastor Brandon prays over all of the prayer requests we get, and he'll reach out to you to let you know that he's prayed for you. So please, take a moment right now to fill that out. After you've done that, go ahead and click the link that says, Give Online. Every week, our church is blessed to be able to change lives through our online ministry, like this worship service, and through our work in the community. That impact is made possible through your gifts, so thank you for giving. And if you'd like to continue to support the work of LUMC, click that link and you'll see a variety of ways that you can give. Now, in this week's message, Pastor Brandon will be taking us through Mark 6 and revealing to us one of the toughest days in Jesus' ministry, a day that leaves him feeling so alone. I wonder what happened. Let's watch and find out. Recently, my daughter and I started playing the game Uno which I actually find to be a very ironic name because it's called Uno, which means one, and yet she sure doesn't seem to be able to play it by herself yet. I mean, shouldn't this be a game for one? Just saying. Either way. We've been playing quite a bit, and we are getting really into it. Like, I'm showing her how to shuffle Vegas style. We're betting chocolate coins on the outcome. Every time a two pops up, we chug some milk. And I remember one particular game where I was on a roll. I mean, every color she put down, I had it. If I didn't have the color, I had the number. I was getting skips, reverses, draw twos, draw four wilds, you name it. And she was actually having to draw a lot of cards, and so I knew I was going to win. And then suddenly, everything shifted. She put down a yellow, and I couldn't find a yellow to save my life. And what's worse, she had an amazing card for every card that I would put down, right? I was drawing two, drawing four, being skipped, reversed. I looked under the table just to make sure that my two-year-old wasn't under there, like feeding her cards. And, and then suddenly, I lost. I went from Uno, the brink of success, to complete defeat. Has that sort of thing ever happened to you? Things were amazing, and then they all just fell apart. Your life was going incredibly well, and then things just seemed to crumble. I mean, maybe that's how life feels right now. Maybe you've had some great seasons in life, but now you feel like you're at the bottom. You're in a dark place, and things just don't seem like they're going to get any better. You wonder, how did you fall so far? Well, let me ask you this. Did you know that Jesus went through the exact same thing. Jesus had moments in his ministry where everything fell apart. I mean, we often think of Jesus as someone who can't fail, but I want, I want you to see a chapter in Mark's gospel where even Jesus' successes turn to failures. And in this, I want you to see some important lessons about those hard seasons in our lives and how they connect to our relationship with Jesus. And so grab your Bibles and your message notes, and let's dive into Mark chapter 6. Now, as I've told you before, as we enter Mark 6, it's important for us to begin by looking back at what happened in Mark chapter 5. And when we finish chapter 5, Jesus had just performed three miracles. He'd healed a demon-possessed man in Gergesa, a Gentile town, casting the demons out of the man and into a massive group of pigs who then jumped off a cliff. Next, he headed to another town on the Sea of Galilee, where he healed both a woman who had been bleeding for 12 years and the 12-year-old daughter of a religious leader. And because of these miracles, Jesus began to attract a lot of fame and attention. People were flocking to see him. They were worshiping him. And these were people who didn't even know him. Which makes what is about to happen next so awful. Because as we begin Mark 6, Jesus goes home. And Mark tells us that things are much different. Jesus travels west to his hometown of Nazareth. 
Now, Nazareth is just about 13 miles from the Sea of Galilee, and it's a really small town, or at least it was at the time of Jesus, less than a, a thousand people. In fact, some estimates suggest that it was only about 100 to 400 people back then. It was so small and so insignificant that it's not even mentioned in the Old Testament. In other words, Nazareth is not the kind of place that would have given Jesus credibility. In fact, upon hearing that Jesus is from Nazareth, his own disciple Nathanael asks, can anything good come from Nazareth? But apparently news of Jesus' fame has found its way back to his hometown and he gets a rather confusing reception from the people who watched him grow up. Mark tells us that the people are amazed by Jesus' teaching and yet despite this, the people are also upset at Jesus. Now that, that's confusing, isn't it? I mean, they think he's an amazing teacher, but they're mad at him? What is it about Jesus that upsets people so much? You would think that his hometown would be excited about everything. He's putting Nazareth on the map. He's changing people's lives. But this is where it's important to look back at what has already happened in Mark's gospel. Remember, Mark never wrote this book with chapters and verses. Those came later. Mark intended for us to hear the story of his gospel from start to finish. And if we heard it like that, we'd remember that just a few chapters ago, in Mark chapter 3, Jesus encountered some people in his hometown. In fact, the people Jesus encountered were his family members. Jesus was teaching a crowd of people, and Mark tells us when his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said he is out of his mind. And then, later on, when Jesus' family arrived and wanted to talk to him, Mark says, Jesus' mother and brothers arrived. Standing outside, they sent someone in to call him. They told him, your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. Who are my mother and my brothers, he asked. Then he looked at those seated in a circle around him and said, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. So what we see here is that Jesus is already not on the best of terms with his own family members. But this tension isn't just between Jesus and his nuclear family. Like we said, Nazareth is a very small town, a few hundred families. Many, if not most, of the people in this town would have been Jesus' family. For some reason, the people who watched Jesus grow up are incredibly upset by what he is now doing. And let me just say, this is one of the huge mysteries in the Gospels. What was it about Jesus that would make those closest to him doubt him? And, and not just doubt him, be angry with him, consider him crazy. Well, this is one of those places where understanding the culture and the mindset of the people around Jesus is incredibly helpful. Jesus lived in an honor-shame culture. And in an honor-shame culture, actions are determined as right and wrong, not by the individual, but by the community. People determine right and wrong based on what society expects of them. For instance, if the community had determined that a violent act was necessary, then the person who commits it wouldn't feel guilty over the act. They would have felt that they had honored their community. And this is because honor-shame cultures are generally collectivist cultures which means that the needs and the priorities and the desires of the community as a whole are what matter most, not the desires of the individual. And, and, and this is hard for us to understand in most Western cultures, since we are such intensely individualistic cultures. But it does explain for us why Jesus is rejected in his hometown. From what we see in scripture, Jesus' earthly father was a carpenter. The Greek word here is tekton. It can be used to describe a carpenter or a stonemason or anyone who works with similar hard materials. And there would have been an expectation that Jesus would have followed in the steps of his father. But as we know, he didn't, at least not long term, right? Yes, the crowd refers to Jesus as a carpenter, but at some point, Jesus left the family business to go into ministry. Now, you might think to yourself, why is that a bad thing? Shouldn't Jesus' family have been proud of him for this? But again, this is where Jesus' culture differs from ours. The typical way that somebody would become a rabbi would be to go through the Jewish education system, Beit Sefer, Beit Talmud, Beit Midrash. 
And, and the climax of this educational process would have been studying under a rabbi. At that point, around the age of 30, the person would then be trained and ready to become a rabbi himself. But there is no evidence that Jesus goes through this process. No evidence that he ever studies under a rabbi. He just suddenly starts his own ministry, teaching things his own way. And this very well could have shamed his family. They would have been looked down upon, criticized by the people around them. His shameful behavior would have brought them shame. I mean, that's how an honor-shame culture works. And that's why there is such hostility toward Jesus. But there's more. Look at, look at how the crowd refers to Jesus. They call him the son of Mary. They don't call him Joseph's son. They call him Mary's son. Even though we know that Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit, as far as the town knows, Mary got pregnant out of wedlock. Joseph adopted Jesus as his son. But this jab shows how the people of the town view Jesus. In their eyes, he's not deserving of this fame and attention. And so Mark tells us that Jesus moves on. He's astonished by their unbelief. And so he leaves to go focus on his true family, what, what he's defined as those who do the will of his father. And in this response, we see an important lesson about how to react when things begin to fall apart. Jesus shows us lesson one. When things fall apart, sometimes all we can do is focus on our next step. Let me say that again. When things fall apart, sometimes all we can do is focus on our next step. Maybe that's the next task in front of us. Maybe that's just waking up and getting dressed. But we take the next step. And for Jesus, we see that the next step is to move on and continue his ministry. After this encounter, he sends his disciples out to spread his ministry to different towns. He empowers them to perform miracles and cast out demons. But here's the hard truth we see unfold in Jesus' life. The hard truth is that the next step on a painful journey may not necessarily be the last step. Just because you're taking the next step doesn't necessarily mean that things are going to get easier quickly. And we see this become all too true for Jesus. In verse 14, all of a sudden we learn that John the Baptist is dead. And I have to be honest, it's really strange how Mark informs us of this. He just blurts it out like it's old news. I mean, it's like the time I came home from college and my parents informed me that they'd given our dog away. I'm like, mom and dad, I didn't say that you could get rid of Snickers. I said you could get rid of my sister. <laughs> but, but that's how Mark breaks this news. All of a sudden, he quotes Herod referring to John's death in the past tense. And that's how we find out. He's just gone. Now, first, we have to talk about why John dies, because this is critical to understanding what Jesus is going through here. Mark tells us of John the Baptist's death, and he connects it with Herod Antipas. Antipas was in charge of the regions of Galilee and Perea. And since Galilee is where most of Jesus's ministry occurs, this is why we see Herod Antipas appear so prominently in the Gospels. This fact also gives us context for the conflict between Herod and John. John performed his ministry along the Jordan. He too crossed into Herod's territory. And in this passage, we learn of events that will ultimately lead to John's death. John is upset because Herod is marrying a woman named Herodias. But the real question is, why? Why does this upset him so much? And the answer to that question is actually fairly complex. You see, when Herod decides to marry Herodias, he's already married, and so is Herodias. Herodias is actually the wife of Herod's brother, Philip, who is also a tetrarch, also a ruler in this area. And so for Herod to marry Herodias, not only must he divorce his wife, and not only must Herodias leave her husband, causing both of them to commit adultery. Additionally, Herodias is his niece the daughter of his brother Aristobulus. And finally, as if all of that wasn't enough, 
The situation, this situation, will ultimately lead to armed conflict between Herod's armies and the armies of his former father-in-law, Aretas, costing innocent people their lives. I mean, this is a moral disaster on many levels. It will harm people far beyond those involved. It highlights the immorality of those in power, those leading this nation, and ultimately, it's something that John will forfeit his life to resist. But, but here's the thing. That's the story Mark tells us. That's the story on the surface. But then there's also the deeper meaning here, the subtle narrative that impacts Jesus. You see, before Mark tells us the story of Herod, he tells us of these rumors spreading about Jesus. And as with any person who is suddenly thrust into celebrity, we see that Jesus quickly is beginning to have questions asked about him. Who is this man really? And several ideas are floated. Some people say Elijah. Others say that one of the prophets has come back. Others say that John the Baptist has been raised from the dead. But there's more to this rumor about Jesus than simply thinking a prophet has returned. This is meant to show us how Jesus was viewed by the people around him. And more importantly, this is meant to indicate how Jesus was viewed by Herod and others in positions of power. Jewish prophets don't often live lives that conclude with happy endings. And one of Jesus' most powerful condemnations of the religious leaders of that time was, Woe to you, because you build tombs for the prophets, and it was your ancestors who killed them. And who were the religious leaders in Mark's gospel talking to just a few chapters ago? The Herodians. The last time there was a reference to Herod's name, the religious leaders and the Herodians were plotting together against Jesus. In just the last chapter, we saw how Jesus is sending the demon-possessed pigs off a cliff into the water, and this is his way of saying that he could kick out Rome if he wanted to. If Jesus is claiming that even Rome isn't strong enough to defeat him, just imagine what kind of a threat Herod perceives to his own power. And then there's the fact that the Jewish historian Josephus tells us that Herod executed John, not just because of the situation with Herodias, but because John had become too popular. John was a threat, and so is Jesus. And this is a subtle hint by Mark that the pain we feel over Jesus' death in this moment is only the beginning. They will do to Jesus what they did to John. And not only do we feel this, but Jesus feels this too. What this moment reminds us of is that Jesus was a threat to the powers that be. And in many ways, Jesus is still a threat. If Jesus is our Lord, that means that everything else comes second. And let's be honest, there are a lot of other things that want to be first in our lives, that want what Jesus deserves. Which leads us to our second lesson, which is that, lesson two, sometimes Jesus is the source of our problems. That's right. Sometimes following Jesus leads to problems. I mean, let me ask you, have you ever been hesitant to tell someone about Jesus or talk about your faith because you're afraid that it will be awkward or cause issues? Are there places in your life where you know that if you were truly faithful to Jesus in the things that you said, in the way that you treated others, in the things that you put first in your life, it would cost you something? Because the truth is, sometimes following Jesus causes problems for us. Being his disciple, truly doing what he's called us to do, can turn our lives upside down. But here's the thing. Jesus promises to be with us on that journey, even in the hardest moments. He just asks us to trust him. And that question of trust is actually the source of the third and final reason for Jesus' pain in this chapter. You see, after the news of John the Baptist's death, Mark tells us of what should be a high point in Jesus' ministry. Jesus begins to preach to a crowd of people who have gathered around him. And as he teaches, the crowd is so enthralled that they don't even leave for food. So Jesus performs this massive miracle of feeding 5,000 men plus women and children with a few loaves and fishes. And as we're reading it, it seems like this should be one of the pinnacle moments of Jesus's ministry, right? Something exciting, something that he could celebrate. But when you look closer, you begin to notice the loneliness that Jesus must feel in this moment. Because while thousands of people have flocked to see him, thousands worship and believe in him, those closest to him, 
just don't get it. The disciples truly don't see the significance of this miracle or what it reveals about Jesus. And very quickly, we recognize that this is a theme in Mark's gospel. Because right after feeding the 5,000, Jesus' disciples are in a boat in the midst of a storm. And so Jesus walks out to them walking on water, but they don't recognize him. And in both the feeding of the 5,000 and the miracle of Jesus walking on the water, we see that the difference between Jesus' disciples and the crowds who have been following him is glaring. The disciples can't imagine how Jesus will feed all of these people despite all they've seen him do. The disciples don't even recognize Jesus walking on water. And then Mark says something that is especially disheartening. He says that the disciples' hearts were hardened. And any Jewish person hearing this would have immediately known the implications of that phrase. When the Israelite people turned away from God, the prophets would say that their hearts were hardened. When Pharaoh refused to free the Israelite people from slavery in Egypt, Scripture says that his heart was hardened. And what's worse, we see multiple connections between Jesus and Moses in these stories which makes it clear that Jesus is being compared to Moses and the disciples are being compared to Pharaoh. Instead of furthering Jesus's ministry, their lack of faith may actually impede it. And these are the men who are closest to him. These are the men we call the chosen. And what it causes you to realize is that at least at this point in Jesus's ministry, he's just so alone. His family rejects him. His town rejects him. His cousin has been killed. And once again, his disciples, who should be furthering this ministry, are getting in the way. I mean, it feels like all Jesus has are the crowds. And anyone who has tasted celebrity will tell you that when all you have is the crowds, you end up feeling so alone. Mark is giving us this powerful glimpse into the person of Jesus. What he's feeling, what he's experiencing. He's allowing us to imagine and connect with Jesus in such a way that the gospel isn't just the story of some man who performed miracles. God isn't just walking the earth, passing through, dispassionately pursuing some mission. Jesus had feelings. Jesus struggled with the same things in his life that we do in our lives. And I think for some of you, that's a message that you really need to hear. Jesus isn't just God. Jesus is God in the flesh. God loves us enough to come into our world and experience it as we experience it. Not to pretend to experience it, but to truly experience it. The good and the bad. And for some of you, when you hear what Jesus is going through in this passage, something hits close to home. Your life has been a lot of ups and downs recently. Maybe even just a lot of downs. Or maybe you're just feeling really alone, disconnected, even from some of the people who you're supposed to be closest to. Some of you are separated from your family right now, or you're being criticized and rejected by the people around you. Some of you have lost someone dear to you, and you're really hurting. Well, here's what I need you to hear today. Here's what I want you to know. This is the lesson. Lesson number three is that Jesus is with you in the midst of your problems and he understands. I mean, we see in this chapter, the things you're going through, he's going through them. He understands. You have a savior who knows what you're feeling. You have a God who cares about you, about what you're going through. Jesus has been where you are. Jesus has felt what you're feeling, but here's the good news. He's not going to leave you there. Because God came to earth to save you, to heal you. And just as Jesus can heal people of demonic possession, just as he can nourish thousands, just as he can walk on water and conquer nature, he can conquer and heal whatever you're going through. And he can nourish you as no one else can. And so if you're hurting today, or if you know someone who's hurting, I really want to pray for you right now, right? We're going to pray together and then I'm going to give you some action steps after this. Let me just pray for you. Oh Lord, we come to you with heavy hearts right now. Some of us feel like we're on our last leg struggling to just make it through today. Some of us are hurting and mourning 
for those that we love, for those that we've lost. Some of us just feel so alone. But Jesus, we know that because of you, we are not alone. You've been where we've been. You know our pain. And we know that you are the only one who can heal and redeem it. And so I pray, Lord, that you will remove the pain of those praying right now. And even those who aren't watching, heal what is broken in their lives. Be their savior and inspire us with your Holy Spirit to be the people who take this good news to others. So that the gift of your salvation may spread even to the ends of the earth. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Okay, now before we close our service, here are some quick next steps for how you can apply what we've talked about today. First, read Mark 6 all the way through. Now that you have all of this information, go read the whole chapter with a fresh set of eyes. See what jumps out at you that you've never seen before. And once you do, I want to invite you to take it a step further. I want to challenge you to invite three people to watch this video with you and discuss it together. Watch this again. Pick up on the things that you've missed watching it the first time. But this time, I want you to do it with friends. Small groups are still open, and now is the perfect time to join. We always learn more with others, and they will pick up on things that you missed. And so find a way to get into a group and watch this together. And then finally, reach out to someone who's hurting. One of the things that stands out to me in this passage is that despite how much Jesus was hurting, he still focused his mission on healing and saving others. And so I want to invite you to look for others who need to hear the good news of Jesus this week and to share his love with them. Have a great week and God bless. Is he 
Well, that's it for our service today. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. If you haven't already done so, please take a moment to check out those links to the side and down below. Fill out a connection card, sign up for a group, and give online. We're so glad that you decided to be with us today, and we'd like to personally invite you back next week as we continue our series, Beyond the Words. Today, we're going to end with one of our special benediction songs. So let's join together and sing.